Hey, Mac. Ingrid. How's everybody today? Okay, no okay, good, good, awesome. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. All right, so we'll just give folks a, a little while to log on and I just wanted to get here early so people logging on could see and we'll just, it'll just get going. All right. Mac, did you get notification from the university? Uh, yes, I got okay. an ND2L. Okay, all right, I just wanted to make sure. Oh, no problem. I got the official notification and they said they would notify everybody in the class, so just wanted to make sure. Y'all, gotcha. I'm going to open up and share my screen with you. This is, I'm going to be honest, this is my very first time of doing a live Zoom class, so I hope it works for us. If it doesn't, well, we'll drop back and punt. I actually have lectures over all of the um, part about preparing the pro forma statements. Got all those lectures recorded, but I just find that it works better to do them you know, face to face live and, and answer questions as we go rather than y'all trying to just watch a video and figure out what I'm talking about. So we'll get started in, in just another few minutes. Everybody healthy and safe and all that good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your many kind words. It's a little scary. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm Thank glad you're fine. I really am. That's that's good. <laughs> well, I am too. It's just kind of, you know, I'm not scared of the virus. Yeah, I, I'm not. But the reality is, it is it is a serious illness. Some people are dying. There's no doubt about it. And the the implications of you know a faculty member getting it and then exposing students and all of that stuff. They told my graduate assistant, who I usually let work in my outer office, I've got a like a secretary's office outside of my office. I usually let Shakiba work in there. And they told him he couldn't even go back in there until they had sanitized the place. Well, I didn't test positive. So I mean it's you know, but it's just like it's a it's a snowball. It, you know, one event triggers all of this other stuff and it just kind of makes it, you know, go a little bit crazy. So just kind of have to kind of have to roll the punches on it. Yep. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad right. to hear that you're doing well and that you test the negative. Yeah, I am too. I'm I'm glad. I I tell you, your mind plays funny tricks on you too when you start thinking through things. My in fact, so my normal temperature runs about ninety seven to ninety seven point five. And yesterday, when when they told me to go to the doctor and get tested, my doctor's office called me, and I went to Clinics North Texas, and they do drive-through testing, and you're sitting here in your vehicle. Normally, when I'm sitting in my vehicle with the air conditioner going and then immediately going to the doctor's office, if they take my temperature, it's not unusual for it to be below 97. <coughs> so when they checked it, it was 98.5. Which is, if, if that's what it is, that's high for me. <laughs> and then you, you know, you, your mind just kind of starts playing tricks on you, like, well, maybe my lymph nodes are a little swollen, or I've got a headache, or maybe I'm running a fever. And you know, the longer it goes that you're waiting on, that you're waiting on um, the test results, the worse it gets. <laughs> so. Yeah. It's kind of like when I like get sick and I start Googling stuff off WebMD and it just freaks me out even more. <laughs> yep, it's, it's absolutely right. You can, you can self-diagnose yourself right into the hospital if you're not careful. <laughs> All right, y'all, so 
on these pro forma statements, what I'm going to do first is just kind of talk through the research that the SBDC has provided for me. And, and my phone is blowing up. I've got, I got a couple of people from class that have texted me. Huh. Did anybody have trouble getting in? Cause I've got a student telling me that they need a passcode. It, it just kicked me out for a second, but I was able to get in without a passcode. Okay, well, let me text Maria. I think it's like when I looked at it and you shared the link, uh -huh. it had it can send you the, uh, the password too, but that's just what I saw. Yeah, it should be embedded in that link. Yeah, and there's another one. So uh, let's see, one more message. Okay, all right. All right, so we're good. So what you see in front of you on my screen, hopefully, is you should see my IBIS World Report. And this is for the furniture industry. So I've got it saved as a PDF. Um, so I went to the Small Business Development Center and I said, okay, can you send me an IBIS World Report on furniture stores in the United States? because in another lifetime, I worked in the furniture industry. My second Fortune 500 job was, I worked in a furniture distribution center. So I know a, quite a bit about that industry. And it's something that we can all pretty easily understand. It's a fairly standard business, fairly low number of transactions, fairly high average transaction. It's really easy to just kind of walk through that information. So when you, decide what your business is going to be, you need to go to the Small Business Development Center. You can either drop by or you can email me, email them rather, and tell them what business you need. Tell them that you're in my class and tell them that you'd like to get the IBIS World Report for that particular industry, okay? Now, sometimes those IBIS World Reports are available not just for the industry in the United States, but you might could get a regional report for example, you might get furniture stores in Texas, or you could get furniture stores in the Southwest US. Um, but I just said, give me the furniture stores in the United States, because I wanted just something that I can run through really quickly with you. As you'll see, I've got my PDF um, Adobe Acrobat Raider open, and this is a 53 page report. If you were to buy this report, then what would happen is you would have to go to ibisworld.com. You would go to their website and it might help for you to just go to ibisworld.com and take a look at whatever industry you're particularly interested in. And there's literally thousands of reports there, but if you're interested in furniture as I was, and by the way, since I've now claimed that industry Nobody else can do that industry because you'd basically just be copying my stuff. Um, you, you see furniture stores in the US and there's online furniture, there's office furniture, there's wholesaling, there's all kinds of stuff. So you can get this report, furniture stores in the United States, and it'll pull up all of the reports that you can access and that gives you the NAICS code. It gives you the first five digits of a six digit NAICS code. And then some of the information is free, but the report is what's really, really expensive. Okay, so if you click on the purchase options, it'll tell you that a single report costs 925 bucks. Okay, so this is secondary market research for you because Ibis World has already gathered the information. They gathered it for their purposes. You can access that information. If you were to try to gather the information and write the report yourself, it would take you a lot more than $925 to do it. So keep in mind, secondary research doesn't mean that something is free. It means it's already been gathered and you're the secondary user of it. Your purposes are secondary to whoever gathered it. In this case, Ibis World is gathering it to make a profit, okay? So you can see what's available. So you may just want to take a look, you know, see what industries are out there, something that interests you. 
you know, for instance, if you were into personal services and you wanted to open a hair salon, you can kind of browse down and you can do by, by nation, look at the reports in there, or you can just do a search, right? If you wanted to do a salon, you could just search for hair and nail salons in the U.S. And that's what's going to come up. It's NAICS code 812110. Take a look at the report, make sure that's what you want. The more information that you can give the SBDC when you're requesting the Ibis World Report, the better they're going to be at giving you exactly what you need to help you, okay? They're usually really, really quick in turning stuff around. I asked them for the Ibis World Report on furniture this morning and you know, it's because it's me, but they had it to me literally in less than five minutes. So it's not something that takes them a tremendous amount of time to pull, but it's incredibly useful for you. So you definitely need to get it, okay? So I'm gonna stop sharing this screen and go back to the report and share with you what's in there, okay? So if you just kind of scroll through, I'm gonna just go to page level here so that I'm only looking at one page at a time. Um, and I can actually make this full screen, I think. Yep, and y'all can still see it. This, is, if you printed it, this is exactly what you have. And you, of course, you got the table of contents. It tells you about Ibis World, tells you the date of the report, tells you about the industry, who the major players are. You've got Ikea and Ashley. Those are the two major players in retail furniture. It's going to give you the breakdown about sales. It's going to talk about external drivers. A lot of the stuff that we've already talked about and lectured over in class is going to be covered in this report. It gives you some key statistics, okay? The industry is about a $60 billion per year industry. The average profit margin in retail furniture is about 4%. And the number of businesses in the United States is 27,539 retail furniture stores. It'll also give you information about growth, both from a historical perspective as well as going forward. Okay, so this information is just kind of a, a sanity check for you. Right, if you've got an industry that's trending negative or historically been negative, that's not an attractive industry. That's not something you would want to get into, okay? But we can use some of this information sort of as a, a reality check for us. So I'm just pulling out my phone for a calculator and I'm going to type in or punch in 58.9 billion, okay? So that's a bunch of zeros. I have to turn my calculator sideways to get that. Okay, it's 58 billion, 900 million. Okay, so that's like that number, which is really, really big. And if, I, if there are 27,539 companies in that business in the United States, that tells me that on average, one furniture store generates a little more than $2 million per year in sales, okay? That's just an average furniture store. So I, I throw stuff out there like that for you, very simply to show you that if you were thinking about the furniture industry and, and you thought that you could open up a furniture store and have $10 million in revenue from a single freestanding furniture store, then that's not likely to happen within a very short time, right? It's going to take you some time. You might get there, but $10 million would be pushing a tremendous amount of furniture out the door, okay? So it just helps to kind of keep your expectations in line. Also, the employment numbers can help with how many employees would you anticipate that an average store needs to have. If there are 27,539 businesses, Okay, and there's 214,000 employees. We simply divide 214, well, 214 by the 27,539. And that tells us that an average furniture store has about eight employees. Okay, so that can kind of help you to, to understand. Okay, 4% profit. You know, if you're a $2 million a year company and you have 4% net profit, that means that 
your expected net profit is going to be $80,000 per year. If you vary too much one way or the other from those industry standards, you have to be prepared to explain yourself to your banker and your business plan really should be an explanation of how you're going to do better than the industry, right? Because I could probably, I mean, we could probably just imagine based on this information right here, the annual growth rate over the last five years, a banker's not going to really be jumping up and down to loan money to someone to open up a furniture store, right? You can take a look at some of the other stuff we'll see in the report. One of the things that it will tell you as you go through, and I'm just trying to get to that specific page, is that this industry is mature, okay? So when an industry is mature, what does that mean? It means that pretty much growth is going to be stagnant. It could be slightly up, it could be slightly down, but in a mature industry, profits are going to be going down and the opportunity within the furniture industry is going to be for consolidation. It's not going to be to open new businesses, it's going to be for existing businesses to purchase up competitors, okay? So the furniture company that I worked for back in the early 90s was Heilig Myers Furniture. Uh, they were based in North Carolina and Heilig Myers was an old chain that was started in the 1930s and they were doing exactly what I'm talking about. The way that they grew the company at the time, they were not only the fastest growing furniture company in the world, but they were also the largest furniture company in the world. They were just going, you know, state to state to state, just gobbling up little small chains. Okay. Like if, um, you know, I, I, the furniture names, it, that I'm accustomed with in, in the Southeast aren't the same out here, but, you know, kind of like, um, oh gosh, what's the one there on Caulfield Road? The, that's a small chain, right? Um, that's got rooms to, or has got Denver mattress and, and all of that stuff together. Y'all yeah, know the one I'm talking about, okay? Or a small chain like Home Zone that's over here on Fairway Boulevard. Right, that's a small chain. And what was happening in the industry is that Holly Myers was just coming through and buying up businesses like that. That's what's called consolidation. Okay, they'd buy, kind of absorb the whole chain, convert it to Holly Myers. Holly Myers peaked at about 900 stores nationally. They grew way too quickly. They operated the company in a, in a very haphazard manner. I was actually terminated from the company because I so violently disagreed with some of the things that they were doing. I was the fleet manager and safety director for the company. And one of the things that I prided myself on was having the cleanest and safest fleet in the Southeast, never got a DOT violation ever in the entire time that I worked for them, never had any type of citation when the DOT would come in and do an audit or when corporate would come in and do an audit. But one of the things that they wanted to do was they wanted to do what's called slip seating. They wanted to not assign trucks to drivers. Okay. So what my drivers had was pride of ownership. They used that vehicle. They respected that vehicle. They wanted to be in that vehicle. They washed that vehicle. I mean, it was like their personal vehicle. They wanted to come in and start slip seating. Well, when you do that, you never know which truck you're going to be in from day to day to day to day. Okay. And it's a very bad practice in the industry because your maintenance goes to heck because your, your utilization goes up because you don't have the opportunity to take that truck out of service. And anyway, long story, long, long story, but I disagreed with that. And it just didn't, I mean, it was just inconsistent with where they were wanting to go. So at any rate, you see that the industry is mature and, you know, given that this was happening 26, 27, years ago when I worked for them back in the early to mid 1990s, it's really mature, right? It's nothing has changed. Okay. If you keep going through the report and there are 53 pages in the report, you begin to see a breakdown of some of the stuff that I was telling you, right? Some of the, the numbers are, are being borne out here, like the industry revenue, 
is 58.9 billion. I know this is really small, y'all. I'm gonna try to blow it up so that you can see it a little better. Okay, what this is showing you is that about 38% of the revenue in the furniture industry is for living room furniture, about 18% for dining room, about 33% or one third is for bedroom furniture, and then the other 11%, they call it miscellaneous, it'd be like occasional furniture or accessories or office furniture, that kind of stuff, okay? So that tells you kind of how the, the revenue breaks down within the industry. If you just keep scrolling through the report, okay, um, it'll tell you about demand determinants. It just gives you really great information. It talks about how your market is broken down by the age of the consumers, okay? Who are who? Who is your primary market? It's, it's going to actually be 25 to 34 and 55 to 64. I mean, that's about 40% of the market, okay? So it just tells you a little bit about the customers and the characteristics that that you're, you're going to be serving, okay? So it talks about international trade, talks about the number of establishments in the United States. Obviously, this is what's called a heat map. The darker the color, the, the more establishments are located there. This really shouldn't be surprising because you've got California, Texas, Florida, and New York. Your four most populous states have the four most furniture stores in the United States, okay? Um, this breaks it down a little bit further. Concentration within the industry is low. Okay, so your two major players, which are, are um, IKEA and Ashley Furniture, they are the only companies that account for more than 5% of revenue. And together they only account for about 18% or so of revenue within the industry. The rest of it is spread out among all of the minor players, places like Rooms to Go, uh, Williams Sonoma, probably Pottery Barn, you know, companies like that, Home Zone, and you know, Furniture Row. That's the one I was trying to think of a while ago. Furniture Row. Okay. Eventually, you'll get into the cost structure benchmarks, and this gives you within the industry, this gives you within the sector. I don't like the way that they have this chart displayed, but the burgundy color here that says profit, this particular color that I'm hovering over right there, hopefully y'all can see my cursor, that particular color is profit, okay? Wages represent roughly 13%, I think, of the, the industry cost. Purchases, about 61% of the industry cost. Profit, it told you earlier in the very beginning of the report that net profit runs about 4% of the total revenues for the industry. So um, that just gives you the breakdown on expenses. Sorry, my dog's pitching a fit to get up in the chair. I've got a little old tiny dog that's got Alzheimer's. <laughs> So this kind of breaks it out a little bit further. Revenue is expected to be 4% of sales, which is down, okay? That's consistent with what I was telling you about it being a mature industry, right? With consolidation, when the industry is mature, profits are going to be declining, and you see that expected to be down about 20% from the five-year period, 15 to 20, for the next five years, 20 to 25. Wage accounts for about 14% of revenue, and it seems to be trending upward, okay? Don't know what's causing that, but wages are trending upward. This could be a little bit confusing for you. This is what we would refer to in the accounting world as cost of goods sold. They're calling it purchases, okay? Now, if we're doing the cash basis of accounting, that is correct. We would call that purchases and it would count as cost of goods sold when we pay for the product rather than when we sell the product, okay? So purchases, just think cost of goods sold. The important thing that I want you to remember here is that cost of goods sold is going to be roughly 60% of sales, 
okay? Um, in other words, if we looked at it from a markup percentage, it would be about a two-thirds markup. If something cost us $60, we're going to mark it up 40 and sell it for 100 okay? Now, in the furniture business, that's not really the way it works. What really happens in the furniture business is stuff gets marked up probably two to three times what it costs the retailer. But, you know, who buys furniture at full price? Nobody ever pays full price for furniture, right? We wait until they put it on sale. And they, they run all kinds of promotions. One of, the, one of the big players in the Southeast and in, in the town that I moved from is um, Turner's Fine Furniture. They've got probably eight or 10 stores there in, in Georgia and Florida, but they run once a year, a half off sale. Okay, so it doesn't take a rocket science to figure out that if our cost of goods sold is 60%, and they're having a half off sale, they would be losing money on every piece that they sold during their sale, right? Well, they're not gonna lose money when they sell it. What they're doing is they're actually marking up the product so that they can then mark it down. They're putting it up to suggested retail price and then marking it 50% off a of suggested retail price and they're still making some margin on the product, okay? So furniture is just one of those things that's got a really high markup but it never sells for what you ask for it, okay? So cost of goods sold, just remember, we're gonna run that at about 60% of sales. Depreciation is not a big deal in that industry. Marketing runs about 3% of sales. Rent runs about 7% of sales. Um, that's gonna be consistent with something that I'll sort of tell you over and over and over again as we talk. I use rules of thumb just based on my experience, it's not stuff that you'll have access to unless you go to somebody that's that spent a lot of time with a lot of different businesses. But one of my rules of thumb is that occupancy costs for your business, no matter what it is, occupancy costs, and by occupancy cost, I mean rent, utilities, maintenance and repairs, property taxes, property insurance, all of those things should be no more than about 10% of your annual revenue, okay? So in other words, if your business has monthly revenues of $200,000, then your rent shouldn't be more than $20,000. Your, your occupancy cost, I should say, shouldn't be more than about 20,000. Your rent probably is gonna come in at about 14,000, but then you're gonna have your utilities and your property taxes and your property insurance and your repairs and maintenance and that kind of stuff that goes along with it. Does that make sense? I, somebody nod. Aliyah, I've got you on the screen. Can you nod for me? It makes sense? Okay, good. All right. So this just gives you some rules of thumb and some guidelines. Utility cost generally very, very low. Competition is high and steady. Okay, there's internal and external competitors. Okay, barriers to entries are low. They're not rising. Okay, this should sound a lot like Porter's Five Forces of Competition, right? Competitive rivalry, barriers to entry, right? Threat of new entrants, all that good stuff. Okay. This shows you the major, major players within the industry. If you go to 2020, uh, looks like to me that the green company, um, Ashley Furniture, has got about 8% market share. Looks like to me on top of them, Ikea has about 10% market share. Hey, look, it tells us that, okay? Ikea, 10.3% market share. It talks about revenue growth and and all those things for each of those competitors, okay? Which is sort of interesting as you look at operating income for Ikea, right? Even as revenue has grown every year in that period, operating income has shrunk. And you see what percentage the operating income has shrunk each of those years, okay? Ashley Furniture, it gives you the same thing. They sort of plateaued in 19 with their market share, gives you information about their financial performance, okay? This is good information to have 
you won't get this information about a normal run of the mill small business. You'll get it for publicly traded companies because it has to be released in their annual 10K filings. They have to release that information to, to shareholders and to the Securities and Exchange Commission, but you won't get good, reliable information like this about the small competitors, okay? Then it, there are some other major, major players in the industry. So I just wanted you to know a little bit about how to really read this IBIS World Report. And I do encourage you to read the IBIS World Report because if you're truly interested in the business that you pick, whatever it is, you pick a business. Only thing I'll say is you can't be in the marijuana business because dispensaries are not legal in Texas yet. And additionally, it's kind of the wild west with regards to the hemp industry and everything. And, and there's a lot of volatility in the industry. So having good information for you to work with would be almost impossible, okay? So you just read the report, take a look at it, understand what the numbers are telling you. When it says purchases, understand that that's talking about cost of goods sold, okay? So the first thing that you should have to do, right, is you wanna pick your business. Whatever business you wanna go into, I picked furniture. So I went to the Small Business Development Center and I asked them for the industry information for the furniture industry. Okay, I've got a deadline on that for you. Okay, I don't have my stuff in front of me, but if you'll look at the handout or look in D2L, you'll see that there is a deadline and they've been told not to help you after that day. Okay, so do you see sort of how helpful this information can be for you as you're preparing your, your pro formas? Does it look like something that you could use? Okay, Zach, give me a thumbs up, good. All right, so I'm going to now go to another piece of information that you're going to need, okay? Once you pick your location, you need to, or excuse me, once you pick your business, you need to pick a location. You've gotta figure out where do you want your business to be located. So there's a good resource, okay? It's called LoopNet. Now, Jake, you could probably educate us about the MLS, right? You know about MLS, right? It's the multiple listing service, which is good for residential real estate. Well, unfortunately, when you get into commercial real estate, there's no multiple listing service for commercial real estate. A lot of real estate listings are what they call pocket listings. Have you ever heard that term, Jake? A pocket listing? What is it? It's a house that's unofficially for sale. In other words, you know that the owner is interested and would sell, but they're not necessarily motivated to sell right now. But if the price is right, they'll do it. Okay. With regards to commercial real estate, that's basically what you have is you have a tremendous number of pocket listings and stuff normally doesn't get, it doesn't hit a realtor's website. It's just basically who you know and who you talk to within the commercial real estate industry. However, LoopNet is attempting to overcome that. This is a database that's similar to the multiple listing service. LoopNet is for commercial real estate and you see it on my, my screen. Now, it's very, very easy to find. It's just loopnet.com, okay, so when you type in loopnet.com. It's going to ask if you'll let it recognize your location. And if you let it recognize your location, it'll pull up wherever you're at, or you can tell it that you want it for a specific location. Okay. So you can look at stuff that's for sale. You can look at stuff for lease. You can look at op auctions, or you can look at businesses that are for sale. Okay. So what we want to look at here is we want to look at locations that are for lease, okay? And when you do that, it's gonna bring you up a map and you can zoom in. Now, this is not all of the commercial properties that are available in Wichita Falls. Very simply, this is all of the ones that are in this particular database. And since this isn't like the MLS, 
think of the MLS like this. MLS is like a dadgum inventory that's real time, that's up to date. It'll show you when something goes under contract or when something sells or when something first goes on the market, right? It's a real time inventory. If you got somebody that's looking for a special property, Jake would tell you, hey, I'm, I'm watching that MLS every day to see if that special house that they want hits the market. And maybe they're looking for a six bedroom, three bath, under 400,000 with a pool, right? Yeah, that, that'd be a pretty strange thing to be looking for, okay? This LoopNet database is not up to date like that. When you start looking at it, you're gonna find some stuff on there that is no longer on the market. You'll find stuff that doesn't have prices. You'll find stuff that's just, just weird, okay? But it is a starting point. It's at least a step in the right direction. And y'all, I'm not asking you to absolutely positively nail down a location, okay? It would be nice if you could tell me exactly where your property is located. But what I would like for you to do is at least to have an idea how much rent would run for a location. If you can't find the exact location, you could give me like a price range that your rent is going to be. It just so happens, this is one reason I picked the furniture industry. If we zoom in here on Wichita Falls, okay, the closer you zoom, the more detail you're going to get. By the way, you can apply filters. You can say, I want for lease, what you're going to use the space for, um, how much you're willing to pay, how much space you need. You can apply as many filters on there as you want to. But if we take a look here, okay, for instance, let's see, I'm trying to orient this fairway. Uh, this is Kemp. Looks like this right here is exactly what I'm looking for, y'all. Okay. This is 3127 Lawrence Road. It's the FFO home. Okay. If I click on that particular listing, it'll pull up the particulars of it. It'll tell me specifically everything that's in their database. Unfortunately for this database, it doesn't have a price. That's bad, right? You know, this is, you'd like to know exactly how much it's going to cost, but what they'll tell you is it's negotiable, okay? And in business, everything is negotiable. Typically, your rent is going to depend upon how long your lease is, how much build out you require them to do. In other words, how much renovation do they have to do to get that location ready for you? Um, it's going to depend on what the nature of the business is. It's going to depend upon whether you get a triple net lease or whether you have a gross lease, okay? So a triple net lease is one that does not include property taxes, it does not include property insurance, and it does not include repairs and maintenance. Now you might say, I've got to maintain the building that I'm renting. Yes, that's the custom in commercial real estate. Can you negotiate it in other ways? Sure you can, right? If you're willing to um, pay more, then the landlord probably is willing to cover all of the system so that you don't have to take that risk. Or if you wanted to, you know, include in your monthly rent payment the property taxes, I'm sure that you wouldn't have to pay the property taxes, right? So it just depends on on what you negotiate. Now this particular location is 20,536 square feet, but it does not give us a price. It just simply says terms are negotiable. So since it doesn't give us a price, what I'm going to do is I'd like to look at other properties that are similar to see how much they're going for per square foot. Does that make sense? Okay. So for instance, if I look at this particular location that's in Parker Square and pull up the particulars of it, okay, this is with Cinemark and Gold's Gym. It's just one of the retail spots in there. It's this particular retail spot that's next to Minchie's, okay? It tells us that 
they've got 1,419 square feet and it's running $16 per square foot per year and that's a triple net lease. Okay. Now remember when we say triple net, what does that mean? It means you have to pay the property taxes, you have to pay the property insurance, and you have to pay for the major repairs and maintenance items. Essentially with a commercial triple net lease, all you're doing is buying access to the box, okay? They're providing you with the location, parking lot, walls, roof, floor, maintaining it's going to be up to you and you're expected to return it in the same condition, okay? So that's $16 per square foot per year. And that's, a, I would say, probably a similar space. Let's see what else is available here in Wichita Falls. So I'm just going to scroll through the listings. Okay, there's a place over by Hobby Lobby, 1,606 square feet. I don't know which particular location it is. It says it's negotiable, okay? So it's next to Aaron's out by Southwest Parkway. Right? It doesn't give us a price. Okay. If we keep looking, there's Bank of America building. That happens to belong to MSU Texas, by the way. Uh, there's a place on Caulfield Road. Okay, this place is negotiable, price upon request. Um, it's fully built out as a standard retail space. You know, the more information that you can nail down, the better you're going to be. I'm gonna scroll down here. This is a much larger location than I would suspect that I would need. Oh goodness, where did it go? Ah, uh, I'm changing my focus here, okay? Let me look at, I wanna get this place out on Seymour Highway. This one right here, I think, or no, 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 okay. It's gonna be in one of these, I think. Yep, Loop 11 and Seymour Highway. So if I look at my list, all right, this is 45,546 square feet. It's the old grocery store at the corner of Loop 11 and Seymour Highway. That's probably twice as much retail space as I need. But if you take a look at the price, it's $8 per square foot per year. Okay, it's a triple net lease. Doesn't include utilities, property expenses, building services, property taxes, okay? There's actually a document there that you can download from loop from LoopNet that give you the particulars on the profit. It's also for sale for $2 million. Okay. Gives you some population information. Okay. So this is just the same kind of flyer that, you know, if you were doing residential real estate, they'd print and give to you. It just gives you the particulars of the location. All right. So what I've done by coming in here is I've gotten an idea of what real estate is going to cost me, I'd love to nail down a price. And I'd love for you to nail down a price, right? But in this case, I don't want you going to a realtor cause they're pretty busy people, okay? And there's probably not a listing on whatever you're looking for. So if you come up with the location and you give me a reasonable price for that location, I'm okay with it, right? Um, you know, gosh, you got seven, anything from 660, you know, to $16 a square foot. And I've seen commercial leases, y'all, as high as $44 per square foot per year, okay? But what I really wanted to, to get at was I want this location, okay? That's gonna be right here. I want the old FFO home location, this one right here, y'all, okay? because it was a furniture store, even though it wasn't there for very long, it was a furniture store. It's about the right size at 20,000 square feet. If I go back to the rule of thumb that I gave y'all a little bit ago, 
about my rent and occupancy cost as a percentage of sales. Okay, this is a pretty big space, right? So let's say that I could lease this location for $12 per square foot per year. And where did I come up with that? It's right halfway between eight and 16, okay? Which was the range that we established between eight and 16. If I rented this location for $12 per square foot per year, then that location is gonna cost me roughly $20,000 per month. Okay, do you see where that came up with that? A head nod or a no or something? Okay, Brian saying yes. Since I'm not getting a lot of affirmatives from, from everybody else, okay, here's, here's the way when you have something that's priced at a square foot per year price, like this location here on Jacksboro Highway, okay? We'll just use it for example, okay? This is a one year lease for 1,440 square, square feet at $12 per square foot per year, okay? Now I, I picked it and I picked the number 12 for, for a really good reason. How many months are there in a year? Twelve. Twelve, right? Yeah, twelve months in a year. So if our rent is twelve dollars per square foot per year, how much is our rent per square foot per month? It's one, right? It's twelve dollars per square foot per year. If I divide that by twelve, because there's twelve months in a year. Would you agree with me that it's a dollar per square foot per month? Yes. Okay, all right. Another way of getting at it, it's the same thing, y'all, okay? This, I'll just use my calculator, it's 1,440 square feet, okay? And it's $12 per square foot per year, so I multiply that times 12. That tells me my annual rent is $17,280 for that particular location, right? Okay. Then if I divide that by 12, that gives me a monthly rate of 1440. Make sense? Yes. Okay. Now, what you have to do is you still have to go in and figure out how much the property taxes are going to be. If there's a marketing flyer, like in this case, hopefully there will be information in this flyer about how much the property taxes run, okay? Uh, it's a dollar per square foot per month. Gives you traffic counts, nearby businesses. It shows you a floor plan. It does not tell you how much the rent is going to be or how much the property taxes are, okay? So this is in Galaxy Center, which is near Barron Brothers and United on Jacksboro Highway. It's 4309 Jacksboro Highway. We're going to open up another window, okay? I want you to go to wichitatax.com. This is, if you're interested in, in opening a business in some other part of the world, this is why I would discourage you from doing that, okay? Because I can tell you where to go in Texas or in the United States. I can tell you where to go to get information. I can't tell you where to go if you're trying to get, um, you know, property tax rates in Dominica or if you're trying to get them in Anguilla or, or Antigua or, you know, in, in Europe. I can't tell you what property tax rates would be, okay? But when you go into which tax, this is the tax office, you can click on property tax online taxes. Jake, this is the same thing that you would do if you were researching a residential property, right? To find out about how much the property taxes are. You can look it up by the property location. This was 4309 Jacksboro. Okay. 
and I'm just going to search for 4309 Jacksboro. You have to be careful when you're looking at the listings in the tax database because sometimes it'll give you personal property, sometimes it will give you real estate. So for instance, if you look at this Carl Hall Insurance. This is for furniture and fixtures that are located inside of the office at that location. This is for business purple, personal property at Transwestern Publishing, okay? You have to scroll through and take a look at what is not business personal property. And that's where the legal is going to come in to play, okay? All of this stuff here is business personal property. You see, furniture and fixtures, business personal property. When you get down here to the legal description that says lot 1E, lot 1 Galaxy subdivision, okay? If you'll click on that, this gives you the property taxes for that particular tract of land and the building that are on it. Okay, so hopefully what you see on the screen now is the total property taxes for that location are $31,666.23 per year. I'm getting that from right here. Okay, make sense? Now what you have to do is you have to figure out of this building, right, how much am I actually renting? So in other words, if I'm renting 1,440 square feet out of that whole building there, the Galaxy Center, what percentage of it is it, okay? If you'll look back at this marketing flyer, okay? Total building size is 60,000 square feet, okay? So, Follow my math here, okay? The property taxes are $31,666.23 per year. But that's for the whole building, right? Right? Okay. I'm not renting the whole building. I'm only renting a very small part of the building. I'm renting 1,440 square feet, okay? This is, this is what I'm building, uh, what I'm renting, okay? So I have to do math, and it's easy math to figure out how much my property taxes are going to be. I'll take 1440, divide that by 60,000, okay? I'm renting 2.4% of that building, okay? So my property tax burden is gonna be 2.4% of the total tax bill. Does that make sense? Okay. So if I go to online taxes, I can multiply my 2.4% times $31,666.23. And my property taxes on my portion of that building are only $760 for the entire year. Okay. That's just math, right? That's my portion of the property taxes for what I'm renting You've got to calculate that because this particular location is triple net, okay? All right, so let's go back again. That was just a location that I wanted to show you for an example. Okay, so now if we look at 3127 Lawrence Road, okay, for FFO Homes location, I'm going to go back to, to property taxes online here at Wichita Tax. And I'm gonna do a search for 3127 Lawrence, okay? I'm not gonna try to figure out whether they abbreviate road. I'm just gonna do 3127 Lawrence, okay? And then you've got business personal property, business personal property all the way down, okay? Then you've got Gary Meehan Properties, 3127 Lawrence Road, lot one and 0.29 acres, okay? Okay, 3127 Lawrence Road. 
So that looks like to me that this is the legal description for that piece of real estate that's located at 3127 Lawrence Road, okay? And when I pull up the property tax record for that location, I find that the annual property taxes for that location are $28,857.13. Okay, make sense? So I need to budget when I'm doing my pro forma statements, I need to budget for that, okay? You with me? I know it's hard to say I either get it or I don't when we're, we're not all together, but okay. Thank you for the few head nods I'm getting, okay? So now we've got kind of enough information to get started. So we're going to open up Excel and I do want you to use Microsoft Excel. Um, if you save it as Google Docs, it won't, it will not work. Because you're an MSU student, you have access to Office 365. Because I'm an MSU employee, I downloaded the full Office suite. It didn't cost me one thin dime. I mean, you can actually go to IT and they will give you a jump drive that has the installation files on it so that you can get that. Okay, so I want you to use Excel. All right, so the first, I'm going to set up a series of sheets, of you know, worksheets in Excel, but the very first worksheet I'm going to put in is going to be my assumptions. Okay, so I'll just name my tab assumptions. And in the very first cell, I'm going to put in Scott's Furniture Express. That's going to be the name of my business, okay? And I'm going to name my spreadsheet. This particular tab is going to be assumptions, okay? So my first assumption is that the business is a retail furniture store, okay? Start with the most basic stuff, okay? The business is a retail furniture store. Um, I went through and gathered some information when I was looking at the IBIS World Reports, if y'all will recall, okay? In the IBIS World Reports, let me share this and go back all the way up to the top. He said that an average store does about $2 million per year. There's a tremendous number of pages in this, y'all. So let me, oh, yeah, okay. Let me come back to this, okay, about this industry. Okay, 58.9 billion, 27,539 businesses. Average business is going to do about 2.1 million. So if I go back to my pro forma statements and put in an assumption that says I anticipate selling, I'm going to start reasonable, right? If an average business does 2.1 million per year, I'm probably going to start less than that. I'm going to say 1.8 million in the first year. And that's just an estimate, okay? We've got to start somewhere. Another assumption that I got from my IBIS World Report is that cost of goods sold are 60.8% of sales, okay? That came from the IBIS World Report. So that's the industry standard. And that's going to be one of my assumptions, okay? My business will have eight employees. If you'll recall, I simply took the total number of businesses and divided that into the total number of employees. It was like 214,000 employees. 
and 27,000 businesses said the average businesses had about eight employees, okay? So I'm going to say my business is average and I have eight employees. The business will be located at 3127 Lawrence Road, okay? Some sub assumptions of that. This is a triple net lease. Okay. What does that mean? It means I have to pay property taxes, right? That's the that's the big one, right? That's the, the great big ugly one. If you'll recall, when I looked up that location, property taxes being $28,857.13. Did that make any of y'all go, <gasps> did it kind of scare you a little bit when you looked at that? No? That sounds like a lot of money to me. I mean, that sounds like a tremendous amount to pay for property taxes for something that you own, okay? But going back to my assumptions, that is one of my assumptions, okay? Property taxes are $28,800 per year. And those taxes, just like your, your house property taxes, they're payable in December each year, okay? Um, you need to budget, you need to say how much your rent is going to be. Rent is, $20,000 per month, okay? Where did I come up with that? That's roughly my $12 figure, $12 per square foot at 20,546 square feet. That simply came from the listing and the fact that they said that the rent is negotiable. I can't imagine that there's a lot of people that are just dying to move into that 20,000 square foot location Okay, so that's that's what I'm gonna gonna start with. Okay. Um, next, since it is a triple net lease, the other expense that I have to pay and get back to my workbook here. Okay, is I have to budget for maintenance and repairs. That's a pretty decent location, but it's also a kind of a no frills location. Um, let's just say that we can budget $500 per month for repairs and maintenance, and we should be okay there, okay? So we've got maintenance and repairs budgeted $500 per month. We've got property taxes at $20,000, $28,800 per year. Property insurance, I'm going to put a budgeted number in of $12,000 per year, okay? Um, I'm gonna budget $12,000 per year for property insurance and there I've covered the obligations that I have for the triple net lease, okay? So do you see I'm just kind of building my assumptions here? So just keep in mind, first thing you gotta do you got to pick what business it is that you want to be in. Once you pick that business, you go to the SBDC and you get the IBIS World Report and you educate yourself about the particulars of that business. The second thing you do after you pick your business is you have to pick a location. Now you just poke around a little bit on the web. Um, if you know somebody in real estate, you might talk to them, but I don't want you going to a realtor and, and you know, burning a lot of their time by saying, hey, can you tell me about this, that, and the other? You don't have to be that precise. I'm kind of violating some of the assumptions that I told you, right? Like if I'm gonna have 1.8 million in sales the first year, and I'm gonna pay property taxes of 30,000 and, and property insurance of 12,000, and I'm up at you know, 40 plus, 240, I'm at $280,000 in occupancy cost. Obviously that's more than 
of my annual sales. I'm, see, I'm kind of violating what my rule of thumb was. But th again, this is just a starting point and I want you going through the process to sort of educate yourself, okay? So at this point, we need to go back to the IBIS World Report. There's more good information that we need to take a look at. If I go down to key statistics in this business, okay? There's some stuff that they give you that's really, really, really good. Okay, looking at key ratios, um, revenue per employee in 2020, it's $275,000 per employee. Okay, so just doing a little logic check on that, 275 times eight, remember I said eight employees, that gives you $2.2 million in annual revenue. We're not very far off of where we said we would be. You've got financial ratios in here. The one that I'm really interested in is day's inventory because that tells me how much inventory I need to have in this furniture store and it says 104 days, okay? That's an important piece of information because in a retail business like this, one of the most expensive costs that you're going to bear will be your beginning inventory, okay? So I'm going to go back to my Excel workbook, okay? And talk about my inventory. Inventory will turn over every 100 days. I'm just kind of rounding down there, okay? So if I know that my inventory turns over every 100 days, I know what my cost of goods sold is, I know what my annual sales are going to be, I can use that math to figure out how much my beginning inventory needs to be, okay? So I'm going to put in my beginning inventory is, and I'm gonna come over here to the right-hand side of the screen and I'm gonna do my calculation, okay? I've got 1.8 million in annual sales. So I'll type that there, okay? That's my sales. My next sell is gonna be cost of goods sold. I'm going to put in 60.8%, okay? So if I do the math on that, my cost of goods sold is for the entire year is going to be $1,094,400. That's my cost of goods sold for the year, okay? There's 365 days per year. And my cost of goods sold, if I do the math on that, my daily cost of goods sold is going to be about $3,000, okay? And my next number is going to be my beginning inventory. My beginning inventory is that number times 100 days, okay? I know that that's a bunch and I probably just left a good many of y'all wondering what the heck I'm trying to do, huh? Can you go over that again? again? Absolutely, absolutely, okay? So remember from my assumptions, I anticipate selling $1.8 million in the first year, okay? Yeah. That's just a number that I looked at what the industry looked like in the United States, and I tried to think about, well, I'm a startup business, what's reasonable for me to do, okay? All right. That, I just said 1.8 million. My IBIS World Report told me that cost of goods sold is 60.8%. 
of sales, right? They call that purchases. I took that directly from the IBIS World Report, okay? So if I multiply 1.8 million times 0 0.608, that tells me how much my cost of goods sold for the entire year are going to be, right? All right. What I'm trying to figure out is how much inventory do I need to buy to have into my store to have the right amount of inventory, okay? So I divide that $1,094,400 by $365. That tells me what my daily cost of goods sold are. And since I also got from my IBIS World Report that the average amount of inventory is 104 days, okay? Remember days inventory 104.3? That's under the industry financial ratio, which is under key statistics in the report, okay? I put in my assumptions here that I have my inventory will turn over every 100 days, okay? So I have to multiply my daily cost of goods sold by 100 to tell me how much inventory I need to have. Does that make sense? Dr. Manley, can you um, make your Excel sheet a little bigger? I sure can. I sure can. Sorry. Thank you for asking. It's hard, it's hard to see. I know. Okay. And Thank particularly you. <laughs> if you're trying to watch it on your phone. Is that better? Yes, thank you. I'm actually on my laptop at work, but yeah, okay. but that's that makes it so much better. Thank you. Okay. And if it would help, I'll I'll upload this video to YouTube and share it with you if that would oh, help. That'd be great. Okay. That'd be great. Okay. Right. So I've got my beginning inventory. I'm trying to figure out how much inventory do I need. I'm gonna give you this is gonna be all I do today because I don't want to go so far since we're not together and I can't really judge if if you're getting everything we're talking about or not. It's you know, it's tough to have a two-way flow of information when I'm talking to a camera. I don't want to go too far with this, but what I'm trying to get at is how much are my startup costs going to be? In an in a business like this, which I'm not buying the real estate, right? So my single biggest expenditure is going to be for inventory. You see, I'm leasing a location that is already a furniture store, right? I mean, FFO Home was in business, they're out. They were a furniture store. I don't have to do anything to remodel that business. You know, the location is set up for furniture. There's plenty of parking. It's an established location. So I don't have a lot of costs there my single biggest cost is going to be my beginning inventory. And I'm just trying to get at the question of how much inventory is it going to take to set this business up? And I'm using my industry information to tell me that, okay? So coming from Ibis World, we learned that an average furniture store does about $2.1 million per year in sales. Now that FFO home location, say what you will, I'll, I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say if we hadn't had COVID and that business model had been a little better executed, they probably wouldn't have been out of business. I, I mean, I think that's actually a pretty darn good location for a furniture store. It's right there on Lawrence Road. I mean, it's in the thick of everything right across from Walmart. I mean, it's a pretty decent location. So I think it's a prime location. So when I say that I'm going to generate 1.8 million in sales the first year, did I pull that number out of thin air? Sort of. I didn't pull it completely out of thin air, but it is my best guess of what I'd be able to do. Okay. So everything that you'll do if you were writing a business plan would be to support your projection of 1.8 million a year in sales. It would be justification of where those numbers come from. Okay. So given that we've got 1.8 million in sales, my question now is how much inventory does it take to make that happen, okay? So I know my cost of goods sold percentage is 60.8%. Okay. 
that's Parabis world. On 1.8 million in sales, my annual cost of goods sold is going to be $1,094,400, okay? Ibis World tells me how many days inventory a business like this typically has, and it's 104 days, okay? So I'm gonna be slightly, just a little bit more efficient than Ibis World. I mean, I could go in there and put 104.3 if I wanted to, but that kind of looks sort of random, right? Okay. I mean, I could say that I would turn my inventory four times per year. If I were in retail clothing, that would be a reasonable assumption. Despite the fact that it's like July out there today. I mean, we have four seasons, spring, summer, winter, fall. Clothing stores typically turn with the seasons. They turn their inventory four times per year. If that were the case that I turned the inventory four times per year, I would simply divide the 1,094,400 by four, and I would see that I need to have roughly $223,000 worth of inventory, okay? Or $273,000 worth of inventory. But because that's not the case, I've got 100 days of inventory. Another way of looking at this would be, I could simply say 100 days is what portion of the year? If I divide 100 by 365, you know, that's 27.4% of the year, right? If I multiply that times 109, or excuse me, times 1 point, or 109,940, 109,4400, okay? That tells me the same exact thing. I need to have $299,836 of beginning inventory. In other words, what am I getting at? My beginning inventory is $300,000, okay? If that's gonna be my single largest expenditure as I start up this business, I need to know how much it is, right? Yep. Royal, can you give me a, another thumbs up? <laughs> Ashley, is, are you good, Maria? Okay, Jose, you good? All I'm trying to do is figure out how much inventory I need. And by the way, I'll go over this again next Wednesday when we are back together, okay? Um, I'll just kind of sum up and say, this is where we are. But here's y'all's deal, okay? If you haven't yet picked a business, you need to do that. You need to do that before next Wednesday and you need to get the Ibis World Report for that. You need to pick a location. The LoopNet, um, website is good, not just for Wichita Falls, it's good for anywhere in the U.S., okay? The quality of the data varies, but that will at least give you an idea of what the going rate for real estate is, okay? So you dig around a little bit and you figure out how much is it going to cost me to lease this location and what are my startup costs going to be? Because the next piece of um, um, financial information that we're going to put together is going to be what we call the sources and uses of funds, okay? Sources and uses of funds is really straightforward. It's where does the money come from and where's the money going to go? If I need $300,000 worth of inventory plus all of my other startup costs, I need to budget those things out, right? And this is just kind of helping me get through that budgeting process. Make sense? Okay, uh, you guys stay safe. I got a notification on my phone just a few minutes ago. I think we've got 67 new cases of COVID in Wichita Falls. So the numbers are not good. Um, I'm very happy that I'm good. Um, we got it on campus. I think there's, I hadn't looked at the numbers today, but last time I looked, it was 44 cases confirmed on campus and I think 11 of them are active. So y'all stay safe, please please stay safe. And um, it is definitely a wake up call for me because I'd much rather be there with you. Um, I will be back on Monday. You know, everything's good. My doctor actually told me that I could be there today and I just have to wear a mask. And I said, that doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work for me to talk through a mask. So I said, I'll take the weekend and that'll give me, you know, that'll give me like 12 days of 
post exposure and and now I think the CDC's new regulation is 10 days. That's what they're saying is if you haven't caught it in 10 days that you're good. So at any rate, okay? Y'all stay safe, be good. I will upload this video and I'll post a link in D2L, okay? Great, All right, thank you. Take care. See y'all next Bye. Monday. Bye. Bye.